Okay, the treats continue, team. So uh, we're now going to ask uh, Vangelis Patalis to come to the to the stage um, and to talk about a very important area for our sector, being the trade and market access area. As New Zealand continues to emerge and engage post-COVID, it's increasingly clear that many of the old trade and market certainties no longer hold true. New risks and opportunities are emerging as the world starts taking geopolitical sides, markets turning more protectionist, and global economic activity enters a soft patch. Here to help us understand how New Zealand, a small trading nation, can steer a leading trade strategy in increasingly turbulent waters is Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade Deputy Secretary Vangelis Vitalis. Look, I'm not going to go through all of the trade negotiations that Vangelis has been involved with, but suffice to say, he has been in every trade negotiation over the last 35 years. Um, Vangelis is a stunning individual. Uh, there are a few people that have done more for our sector than Vangelis Vitalis, highly respected and revered internationally. Uh, Vangelis Vitalis, um, please come to the stage. Identify who you meet. Um, thanks very much, Mike. And um, I mean, you'll have heard at the start there that um, I'm here to talk about some of the real challenges that we um, that we face internationally, and a little bit. Um, I'm going to try to give a little bit of an optimistic take on that as well. Although I do think the situation is going to get harder and harder over the coming sort of decade uh, as we look out. But I'm going to talk in four parts. First of all, I'm going to sketch the international context and how that looks to us um, in the foreign ministry. I'm going to talk about the changing nature of trade, some of the big themes that are emerging and some of the big challenges that are out there, both for your sector and for New Zealand in general. The third area I'm going to talk about is to identify some of the, the old familiar challenges that continue to um, be present um, for, for you as a sector and again for the wider agricultural sector in New Zealand. But then I also want to talk about some of the newer challenges that are emerging and how we're going to need to respond and be deft and nimble uh, in terms of the way in which we present ourselves internationally. And my fourth area, the larger part of this is going to be really about what the New Zealand response is and the response is going to, I'm going to argue, is going to be needing to be in three parts. The first is that we need to continue building the trade depth, the strategic trade depth that we've been looking to do over the last 20 years. But then I'm also going to argue that we also need to work harder in implementing and getting the full benefit of the trade agreements that we've already negotiated, as well as looking to one or two really big negotiations that are still out there to achieve. And I'm also going to identify for you how we as a foreign ministry, a foreign affairs and trade ministry, is trying to retool itself uh, to make sure that we are fit for purpose to assist you in the turbulence that we've got out there uh, looming. And then I'm going to look to conclude. I think the first thing to say, and many of you have heard me speak before, have heard me use the phrase, the golden weather for New Zealand trade policy has really ended. The golden weather, just to refresh your memory, really from my perspective, started in 1995 with the establishment of the World Trade Organization. Significant date, because that is the, day, the date at which agriculture and your sector was brought into the international rules-based trading system. And when I say the international rules-based trading system, I'm not talking about a UN agreement, which is not, does not have the enforceability of the trade agreements that we have. I'm talking about the World Trade Organization, where we could take, as a country, we could take a member like the United States on sheep meat to court. They could be found to be in breach of their obligations to us and they would have to bring their regime into compliance. That's exactly what has happened. We also were able to take Indonesia, again taking a meat sector, a red meat sector example, we were able to take Indonesia to court for some of the non-tariff measures that, is, that it was implementing. And again, we could win that case. The rules worked. The second major assumption of the golden weather for New Zealand was that protectionism would decline. A combination of the World Trade Organization commitments, now 164 members, plus the various free trade agreements that New Zealand was negotiating drove that protectionism down. And the third key component of the golden weather was that New Zealanders in general, and in particular, believed that trade was a good thing, that trade agreements were um, providing prosperity, 
productivity, employment and incomes, and they were absolutely right. One in four New Zealanders' jobs depends on trade. Your income, if you are an export-focused sector, is up to 14% higher than if you're in a domestically focused um, sector. That was the golden weather. That golden weather is now over. The rules that we depended on in the World Trade Organization are no longer fit for purpose. They do not have the ability anymore for us. We can still take cases, but their enforceability now is really in question because you can no longer hear appeals to the case because the United States has refused to join a consensus to appoint judges to hear those appeals. That means that if we're in a situation again, as we were in the late 90s when the United States imposes uh, measures against land, we are not going to be able to use that World Trade Organization system in the way we've become accustomed to. So the rules no longer have the power and the force that we depended on for so long, for more than two decades. Second, protectionism is back up and rising. There's a function of COVID in there as well, but the big challenge that we have is a combination of the old tariff increases that you've seen, and you saw the tit-for-tat um, tariff war between China and the United States, but also a whole set of insidious, and I saw your report, uh, which makes for gripping reading about the range of non-tariff barriers that are emerging internationally. A big looming challenge for the sector and for New Zealand in, in particular. And third, that social licence. It's easy to forget that New Zealanders, as reflected by the two major political parties, supported all of the trade agreements that we've been negotiating until TPP. And at that point, bipartisanship was fractured and that social licence then for trade became very, very fragile indeed. And you should not, and we must not, take it for granted that that will be sustained into the future as well. It is critically important if we're going to negotiate trade agreements that New Zealanders in general are supportive of those agreements and that matters to you as a sector and it matters to us as officials, as negotiators and it matters to our partners internationally. We are simply too small to give them the headaches of having protesters or being pulled in front of tribunals. Those kinds of challenges the big players can do without and they will move on without us. So social licence is critically important. So then that golden weather, with that golden weather concluding, what does that international context now look like? Well, the first thing we have to acknowledge is there's a war. A war that's having an impact, not just in terms of the moral uh, challenge that Russia has, faced, has confronted everyone with, with its illegal attack on Ukraine, but it's also driving prices. If you look at fertiliser prices, if you look at uh, petrol prices, internationally, all of the inputs that you as the sector depend on are now much more expensive than they used to. COVID is still there. So we have a war, we have a plague, and COVID of course affects both supply and demand, and it affects the way in which we can move product internationally. Again, a continuing challenge. So the war, the plague, we of course have climate change, which was brought home to New Zealand. We now have a climate, uh, sorry, we now have a cyclone season in New Zealand something that would have been unimaginable even five years ago. And geopolitics is back in a way that we have not experienced previously. The tension between China and the United States is intense and difficult. Don't get caught in the crossfire. And if you're in any doubt about how challenging and bruising this can get, just ask Australian wine exporters, just ask Australian barley exporters. Just ask Australian coal exporters. The challenges out there are real and we are going to need to think about how we manage and mitigate those risks that are emerging out of the geopolitical tensions that, are, that uh, exist across um, the globe. And perhaps to make one specific point, I've spoken about the general, but let me make a specific point about the trade policy. Throughout my career, we have depended on US leadership in trade policy. The big achievements that were made in the Uruguay round, the elimination of agricultural export subsidies, in my view, they could not have happened without US leadership. The US is not in that space anymore and we are having to reorientate the way we think about international trade policy in the absence 
of that firm and clear leadership that constructed the system on which we depend so significantly today. So that brings me to the second part of my presentation, which is the changing face of trade. And here to make the ob observation that when we were negotiating, and I want to acknowledge David Walker if he's here today, who was the chief negotiator for the China uh, Free Trade Agreement, uh, which I was privileged to be part of his team, um, who would have thought in 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, when we were doing those negotiations, when China was barely in the top 15 of our trading partners, that it would be such a significant player, not just for New Zealand, but also for the other 134 WTO members for whom China is the number one trading partner. So the rise of China, the re-emergence of India, those are big features that were not there even 10, 15 years ago. Second, the changing nature of trade. If we look at what's happening in the digital space, if you think about how much of your certification and the procedures that you can do, that you could do digitally, you can see the tremendous potential, especially for a distant economy like ours. But at the same time, there are looming challenges as well as, of course, we need to say opportunities. What does artificial intelligence mean for the sector? How should you be thinking about what that means for the opportunities for you to sell and export internationally? And the third area I want to focus on is the changing nature of trade, so not just the rise of China and India and other major actors, not just the explosion in digital, but also the way in which the public, the general public, now thinks about the role of trade, their expectations about what trade agreements need to contain, things that we would not think have thought about 10 to 15 years ago, labour standards, climate change, the public seeking answers to, particularly in developed economies, as I'm going to reference shortly, about what they expect from trade agreements that they're going to be prepared to ratify through their democratic processes. Now the third part of my presentation is really about the, the challenges that the sector faces. And I want to make a distinction between the old familiar challenges that are not gone, and the challenges that we now face that have really loomed increasingly large. First of all, the old challenges. Agricultural tariffs. A significant handbrake on the sector, a significant handbrake on the meat industry. If there's any doubt about how challenging that is, just look at the difficulties we had with the European Union and the difficulties that we continue to have in a whole range of other economies internationally. So there's tariffs. But there's also subsidies. We must not forget the pernicious impact that subsidies, global subsidies, have on prices. According to some estimates, the impact of global subsidisation at present affects prices between 6 and 14%. In other words, it depresses prices. That's money off the bottom line of the sector. And it's very interesting to me to look at the data and see that in 1992, two major economies accounted for 74% of all subsidies, the European Union and the United States. Colossal sums being spent in the 90s. Today, four economies account for 78% of global subsidies, the trade distorting ones that we understand through the World Trade Organization. The United States, the EU, so our usual suspects, but we have added to that India and China. So we have two new-ish players who are spending their money to support farmers in a way that does not level the playing field but distorts the conditions under which you compete internationally. So on top of tariffs, you now have subsidies as well. And that brings me then to the new challenges. And the new challenges, the one that I want to focus on particular that I see as one of the risks, but also potentially one of the ones where this sector is well placed to tackle, and that's environmental measures. World Trade Organization has estimated that in 2018, there were less than 1,000 new environmental regulations put in place by the WTO membership. Last year, so remember last, two years ago, sorry, four years ago, 2018, less than 1,000, 
In 2022, there were 3,564 new environment regulations implemented by members. Now, many of those are legitimate, but many of those are going to pose a significant challenge to our export opportunities out there. The other thing, so we're seeing the environmental measures creeping in. There's the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which the European Union now has in place. It's not yet charging for it, but it now has a shadow system in place for steel, aluminium, and some chemicals. I think the other interesting feature is the rise in the way in which countries' expectations of what the trade agreement needs to contain and who they will ratify trade agreements is now an increasing feature of the way in which we negotiate these trade agreements. It's very important to remember it's not enough to conclude a negotiation. You also need that trade agreement to go through the Parliament of those countries. And to give you, let me take two recent examples. We were called in front of the British Select Committee that was hearing the, uh, was considering the uh, New Zealand-UK free trade agreement with some incredible wins for the meat industry. We appeared in front of it four times. Let me give you a flavour of some of the questions that we were asked. What is so sustainable, I was asked, about giving competitive advantage to New Zealand consumer products that have to travel 19,000 kilometres in sea containers or cargo planes before reaching British supermarkets? Let's take an example from the European Union. So the European Union parliaments, the European Union Parliament needs to agree our free trade agreement, but one parliament in particular has already got out ahead, the Dutch Parliament, and it asked this question. What is the expected impact on intensification, environmental impact and animal welfare of livestock production in the Netherlands compared to New Zealand? And then with a follow-up question, do you agree that it is unfair on the one hand to expect Dutch farmers to become more sustainable and comply with nitrogen rules, but on the other hand, to open the doors wide to products from New Zealand farmers who don't face the same regulation. Remember, these are the parliaments that we need to persuade to bring these agreements into force. Let me give you an example from the British Parliament. Two related questions. What is the expected impact on greenhouse gas emissions of additional production in New Zealand as a result of this free trade agreement? Number one. Will those emissions be offset by the UK or by New Zealand, and if so, how? These are the questions that we were being asked about a free trade agreement. And that is clearly the expectation of those democratic parliaments that need to approve these treaties. We have a good story to tell. We were able to answer those questions, and we were able to answer them because we have a credible, narrative, we're a serious country, we have material that we can demonstrably show that we more than meet the requirements and in fact in many cases exceed them. But be in no doubt of the challenge and if you're in any doubt about the potential for this to go wrong, just ask the Brazilians. Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, and um, I forgot the last one. Uh, Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay, sorry. Those four countries, the Mercosur countries, negotiated what is easily the largest and commercially most significant free trade agreement that the Europeans had negotiated, according to the European Union's own assessment. And that agreement has not been brought into force because the European Parliament refuses to consider its ratification until there is an outcome on deforestation and protecting the Amazon in the agreement. This is the most commercially significant agreement that the EU has ever negotiated, according to the European Union. And it's not ratified because of an environment, climate change, Amazon concern. So this is one of the things in this new world that we're going to have to grapple with, we're going to have to have good answers for, and we're going to need to step up to. 
That now brings me to, so what's the New Zealand response to these emerging challenges that are out there in my sort of last 10 minutes here? The first thing that I want to draw your attention to is this chart. This is about New Zealand building its strategic depth and resilience and managing and mitigating our China Plus strategy. So you can see the dark blue one is our exports to China, but you can see very significantly that the CPTPP partners, we're actually exporting more to them. If you add the UK to that, it gets even greater because of course the British have now joined CPTPP. Then you add the ASEAN agreement to it, which is a story of Indonesia, of course, 34.4 billion versus 22.9 billion. You add the EU FTA, you get to 40.4. Economists love aggregate numbers, but we also look at the disaggregated numbers. And the one challenge that I do want to flag to you is that for your sector, the numbers don't look quite so healthy. There is a heavy preponderance of your sector in the blue uh, bar chart there. And that is one of the points that I do want to make to you is that we need to have a manage a way to manage that diversification risk. This is again, this falls into the old challenge, not the new challenge. New Zealand managed this when it had that very close relationship with the British in, until the 1970s. This here, we also need to grapple with. We need to manage and we need to mitigate. Those are the two sides of the coin that I argue need to inform the way in which we think about our relationship. So the first thing we need to do is we need to continue building that trade depth and resilience. A key piece for me is CPTPP in there. That is an expanding agreement. We're gonna have new members added to that, and it, of course, we've always hoped is a vehicle for the United States to rejoin a market access focused agreement in our region. The second side I wanna draw your attention to is my argument about implementation. The OECD estimates that countries can lose up to 40% of the value of a trade agreement through poor implementation. My point here is not that we've reached peak FTAs. We haven't. We haven't. We are still short of that curve. We are now, if we assume that the agreement with the European Union is ratified sometime next year on both sides, both in Europe and in New Zealand, that that will get up to about 73, 74% of our exports covered by these legally binding and forcible trade agreements. But to get us to close to 90%, we need two big agreements. One is clearly the United States, and the other, of course, is India. And those are two big challenges because neither of those partners is particularly enthusiastic about a negotiation with a country like ours, an open market, offering very little immediate benefit, but bringing a whole lot of sensitive issues to the table for them. And we saw the Australians, of course, excluded dairy from their agreement, their early harvest agreement um, with, uh, with India. So to move us up that scale, we need to be thinking about that, but we also need to be thinking about how we implement those agreements. And that brings me to the interesting dimension that we do need to be thinking about, which is what are we going to do about non-tariff barriers? Now here I want to make two observations. The first is that the, the Foreign Ministry, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, together with other agencies, is already working on sort of an economic diplomacy program, if you like. We love those phrases. This is the idea that we work for you offshore and we look to deliver things like market intelligence reports. These are free. There are nearly 500 free reports on the website. Please subscribe. We welcome feedback on those reports. They are crisp, they are clear, and they're designed to inform exporters out there in the sector looking for A, new opportunities, or to understand existing markets. But perhaps the most significant thing that we're trying to do, and this is a cross-agency effort, I want to acknowledge in particular MPI colleagues <coughs> here for the work that they do together with us, which is working on non-tariff barriers. Let me give you a couple of practical examples of recent work that's been done on this, without naming the particular countries. Things like one country changing the shelf life requirements for meat. From 120 days, suddenly they made it 90 days. 
No science-based reason for that. They just did it. That took several months of action by MPI, by MFAT officials, to turn that around. That was worth $7 million of exports. Take another example. The way in which boxes and bags of liver were sealed suddenly changed. One agency required it to be done one particular way, affecting $30 million worth of our trade. Again, the interagency work, particularly again, I want to acknowledge the MPI's work here, turned that around. And then there was the case of the pre-approvals. There was an agreement with one particular Southeast Asian economy to have pre-approvals. In other words, that you could pre-approve an export consignment that could then simply come into the market. But despite the good words on paper, the action wasn't happening at the border. I can remember having to raise this with my counterpart on multiple occasions, at the WTO, bilaterally, and MPI colleagues were particularly busy on this one as well. That was worth uh, $20 million. So those are the kinds of practical pieces of work that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, MPI, the customs, uh, our customs guys, the work that we do collectively to try to address the big challenges that are out there that are real money and affecting it, affecting the sector. I think we're going to need to be a bit more creative. I think we're going to need to start thinking about how we work in coalitions, groups of economies, to break down these kinds of barriers. Because we're finding other colleagues of ours, whether they're the Chileans, whether they're the Europeans, whether even the Americans, where they're finding particular barriers, and we need to be more active, I believe, in working together to build those coalitions to push back against those barriers. So we are going to be thinking creatively before the end of the year about how we might frame that up, what that might look like, and which countries we could work together on. Obviously, many of the Cairns Group countries, Australia, Brazil and others, are obvious targets for us in this area to work together. My little one observation, my little advertorial for the tariff barrier one is to the guaranteed two working day response time. You send us, not, I'm not guaranteeing that we can fix it in two working days, but that, but that we will come back to you. And we'll come back to you quickly, and then we will, over the next sort of two to three weeks, we'll be working on a plan. And this is a plan that will involve all of the agencies of government, MPI, Customs, MB, MFAT, and we're working on a plan, how do we deal with the problem that you've got? And that little hit squad that then deals with those non-tariff barriers is a critical part of the way in which we manage the turbulence that out, that's out there now for us internationally. So look, let me, let me now conclude by making the observation that look, the golden weather's definitely over for New Zealand trade policy. Those three assumptions, that the rules would work, that protectionism would decline, that the social licence would be sustained both in New Zealand and internationally, that's clearly not the case anymore. We are going to have to work together. We are going to need to be pulling together to address some old challenges, tariffs, subsidies, and that can only be done in the World Trade Organisation. And we're going to need to enforce our rights. And if you're in any doubt about how serious New Zealand is about enforcing its rights through the free trade agreements that now exist, look at the case we're now taking against Canada uh, because we believe that uh, we're not able to access the fully negotiated access that we secured uh, in dairy. So we are now using a free trade agreement to enforce our rights. So when we think someone's cheated us, we are prepared to take that step. But before you take that step, there are also a number of other measures you can do and take we need to be more active in implementing our free trade agreements and using the mechanisms that are there to try to drive change, particularly in the non-tariff barrier space. There are big things that we need to grapple with together. We're going to need to continue to build that resilience and build that framework out there. We are going to need to deal and find a way to work with India. We're also going to need to find mechanisms and pathways for the United States to meaningfully rejoin not only the Indo-Pacific region, but also to engage in market access and rule setting. That is going to take time, but we're persistent little buggers, and this is the kind of thing that we do need to be thinking about over the next 
decade or so. And we need to be prepared to try some new things, and that's my point about the non-tariff barriers. But above all, I did want to leave you with one thought, which is, we're from the government, we're here to help. Um, I don't know why that always gets me a cheap laugh. Um, but I do want to make the point, agencies, and this is not just an MFAT thing, this is a cross-agency effort. We are pulled together and we work together for the sectors out there in the agriculture sector and other areas, trying to address the barriers you face and to bring those down. But please, the market reports, the market intelligence reports, they're one of those new things. As I said, we've got nearly 500 up there. Please subscribe to those, pick those up, have a read of them. If you don't like them, tell us. That's the feedback that we value, that we need to get from you. So look, I hope I've given you a bit of a flavour. Yes, golden weather's ended. Yes, things are going to get hard and harder. But I am actually optimistic that the strategy we have in place and the quality of your sector and the way in which you're thinking about the big challenges out there are actually going to uh, set us up really well to manage and mitigate that turbulence and the challenges that are out there. My thanks to you.